All right, you have been blowing us away with some amazing questions. So today on Limitless TV, we've got more answers coming your way. All right, today's question first kicks off with funny vids. How would I go about investing in real estate in a market where the average house price is $1 million? I live in Auckland, New Zealand, and I've got $3,000. All right, really good question, funny vids. Listen, you're not going to buy million dollar houses, especially if you got $3,000. We need to get you into a different marketplace. And you gotta get yourself into a marketplace where your homes are around your, your country's national median. That's where you're gonna have your greatest safety. And if you go 20 to 30% below the national median, that's where you're gonna find your greatest level of safety and security. So that's the market that you wanna specialize in. And where you have $3,000 saved up, I'm gonna recommend that you watch some of my videos that talk about buying a primary residence that you can treat like an investment. For example, if you're single, you can buy a house and you can put some roommates in there and do the math ahead of time to make sure that it's gonna easily cover the mortgage and you can live for free. I've helped some of my friends and buddies do that over the years. Or if you're a family man, you could rent a house where you gotta, you're paying rent anyway, so don't throw it away. Get into a house with a really good equity position. And ultimately, you need to be in a market that makes sense. Once you live in a market that financially doesn't make sense, it, it escalates the risk substantially. So you gotta get in a different market. Watch some of my videos that will show you how to do that. Okay, very similar question from Victor Chang. How would this work in New York City? I don't think it would. Well, you know what, you're right. Sometimes buying an inexpensive home downtown in the city is half a million, $700,000. It's not an ideal market for a beginner investor to start out in. In fact, that's a very specific type of market. But if you, if you head 60 to 90 minutes into the suburbs, you can all of a sudden find houses that are in the 300, the 200, and the 150,000 price range. Get below that national median, just like, I, just like the advice that I had for our other friend there. R. Gonzalez, 0117. Shame banks don't do loans on equity anymore ever since 2008. Unless you're an extremely well-qualified individual and the property in question is of interest in the bank. Banks notice how risky lending on equity is and if no one believes me, go to your local banks and make an inquiry. Interesting story and congratulations on your success this far. Hey, R. Gonzalez, 0117, I appreciate that. Thank you, we're having some great success. And um, you're right, there's a lot of banks that are not lending on equity in-house. As a general rule of thumb, banks in a really risky market like this want to have a 20 or a 30% equity. So for example, if your house is half paid off, banks will actually lend to you. But if you owe 80% of the value of your home, banks are not gonna lend to you. And all that means is you get to discover a different strategy and run with a different strategy. Or sell the house, and that's another way to get the equity out of it. Ultimately, this idea that it takes money to make money, certainly not always true, but it certainly opens up options. And a lot of times people will sell their house to get the equity out because that's the best option that they have because banks aren't lending. Generally, you're gonna have to have you know, more than 20 or 30% of the house paid down for a bank to lend you in today's market. Okay, question from Jonathan W. Chris, what type of loan did you use to purchase your third, fourth, and fifth property? Was it owner financing, a conventional loan? This is a good question. So Jonathan, I actually used my own credit to help purchase my first three properties. My fourth, my fifth, and my sixth home, I was using someone else's credit. Banks today will lend generally on a max of somewhere between four and 10 homes. After that, you get, you get, you get cut off. And that doesn't mean you can't invest anymore, but it does mean you need to switch the strategy. So for me, that strategy was going to my father-in-law. And after I built up some rapport with my own deals and my father-in-law's, I just started doing lunch with other successful people and saying, hey, here's my portfolio, here's what I'm doing. And a lot of them would kick in and say, hey, let's do a deal together. And we would use their credit and we would use their money and then I would use my system to do the deal and then we'd have that 50-50 partnership. And it's been a great way. I'll, I'll probably invest that way for the rest of my life. Ricardo Hernandez, I got a question. What happens to the house that you were once living in? Did you sell it, keep it, or rent it? Good question, Ricardo. I actually held that house and lived in it for two years. So I bought it as an investment. I, I lived in it, I was living in it for free. And then when it came time to get into my next house, I bought another house with a basement apartment that I could also live in for free. But because that first house, the basement was already covering the mortgage, the exciting thing was I turned it into a lease option and I was making $550 a month cash flow, which was awesome. It, it actually felt amazing. And then 
three years later, I ended up selling it at top dollar. So I held that house for a short period of time and then I remember the day that I sold it. I, I got this really big check from the bank and uh, from the closing title company. And uh, I looked at it and I put it in the bank and I thought, this is amazing, I'm gonna go buy more homes. And then I thought, you know what, why did I do that? It could have actually kept the house longer, refinanced and put the money in another property and had two properties instead of one. And so there's an appropriate time to sell homes. Either the market is, is at a point where it is today where this is a great market for selling off inventory or if it was a lease option and I was helping a family get into it, I'm happy for them when they buy it. But generally, I'm waiting for the best time in the market or helping a family out. Other than that, I, I hold on to my homes. Generally, seven years is kind of when the homes start dilapidating, disrepair, needing to invest money in. So it's also more of a short-term buy and hold strategy that if I can hang on to it for four, five, six years and sell it, that's also another great way to liquidate the property at a great time before I have to double down and put some reinvestment back into it. Byron Harris, did you ever get all three credit cards simultaneously? I'm trying to get some sort of credit and get it built up. Going with the FHA strategy, any advice would be greatly appreciated. So Byron, this is a great question. I'll tell you right now, Byron Harris, that if you go to creditcards.com, you can easily get a bunch of credit cards right now. But you need to be careful of the level of inquiries you make. For example, someone's wondering, well, why not five cards? Why not 10 cards? If you too rapidly open up too many lines of credit, then it's actually gonna start nailing your credit and it's gonna reflect poorly. So what's important is having three lines of credit. And right now, if you have any less than that, apply for some. Even if you don't have great credit, but it's getting like a secured credit card or a low limit credit card, get it anyway. That's where you get to start out at. And so you wanna make sure that you have a minimum of three lines open. Because I've been using credit for such a long time, I probably have 20 or 30 lines of credit. And it's probably even hurting my credit score because I've got so many lines of credit. But you know, it's all relative. I still have excellent credit and it's still working for me. And so, it, you know, having a 750 score is okay for me as opposed to having an 800 score because I'm using that credit. I'm leveraging it in business. I'm leveraging it in deals and um, I'm using it responsibly to build my portfolio and create wealth with it. So really great question. Yes, go ahead and get those lines of credit. You want to have a minimum of three lines that you're responsibly building with. And generally, you don't want to keep more than a 30% balance. So if you have a a $3,000 3, credit card, never keep more than 1000 on it. In fact, if you can, just use it and pay it off regularly. That is gonna help you establish a really great credit score with a little bit of time. Okay, this one comes from Shane Simpson. Shane says, so to cover most of the mortgage costs, you rented out the basement on the first house, but in California, not many houses have basements. This is true. Would a low cost entry strategy such as what you did not be as effective in California? I see converting a garage into a habitable space on an option, but it's a lot less cost and effort. I would love to hear your input on this. Great videos, very well made, super informative. Thanks Shane, appreciate it. You know, not all places around the country have basement apartments, but places around the country do have duplexes. They do have mother-in-law apartments and they typically go more side by side or a rental unit that is above ground as opposed to below ground. And so you're still gonna find similar strategies. On one of my houses, I did convert the, the garage on a three bedroom into a fourth bedroom and ended up selling that house and I made a, a huge pile of money because there was a big difference in that neighborhood between a three bedroom and a four bedroom. It cost just three, four thousand dollars to convert it over, lease optioned it for a while, made a killer cash flow on it, and ended up selling it for over seventy thousand dollar profit. So that could be another strategy that's super that, that's a valid way of how do I add value. You know, for me if I can ever get a basement apartment, that's just bonus. That's frosting. My cake has to taste good without frosting, which means buy it with equity. And that is something that you can do in California. Okay. Darling Jewel. Hi darling. Darling says, have you ever bought or rented out condos? It seems like a smaller place to start. Darling, I won't touch condos and townhomes. And I, this is just personally for me. And the reason why is they don't gain the kind of appreciation and value that a single family home does. I would prefer that you start in a slightly higher price and I never buy anything below a three bedroom, one bath. That's my entry level. In fact, if you look at what happens in values on a two bedroom home versus a three bedroom home, it's a monster difference. And so condos are often two bedrooms. They can be three bedrooms. They just don't appreciate the way homes do. And so it typically makes for a, a much better investment if you can start with entry level single family homes as opposed to condos. Great question. Peter Papp. Peter, thanks for posting this video. It gives me more drive and ambition to get started. 
I'm 22 years old. Hey, I was too when I got started. Good job, brother. I'm in college. I'm a student trying to get ahead of the game by investing in rental properties. However, my biggest obstacle is the legal side with tenants. My question to you is this. When renting out, what type of agreements or lease papers do you use to guarantee that they have to pay? My biggest fear is that I'm doing something wrong legally. Peter, you've got all the right concerns. It is so important to make sure that for your area that you live in, there's certain bylaws and things that are, are gonna be really important. You can go to LegalZoom for your state and you can buy rental contracts that'll kinda of really show you what, what's normal for the area. You might even find a really inexpensive lawyer, I know it sounds like an oxymoron, and just ask them to review a contract or supply a contract, and it's usually not gonna cost you a lot of money. That's gonna make sure that legally you're doing everything correctly. Understand all the fine print. Understand that everything that's in the contract, that's an important part of winning the game. But honestly, I don't think it's nearly as big as an obstacle as you might think. I'd let that fear go. I'd just double check, make sure that you're doing everything correctly, and you are good to go, Peter Pat. All right, David James. So if you're dumping single family rentals after four to five years and holding them short term, what do you do about the capital gains tax on sales since you're not owner occupant? I owned approximately two rentals and a third that I expect by next year. And it's very slow going so far because I can't use my home equity loans from the banks just yet. David, these are really good questions. And in the beginning, two or three homes, congratulations. Give that five years and two or three homes can turn into a dozen. So it's exciting to see how they grow with time, even if it feels a little bit slow at first. So with your question here on dumping it after 45 years and the capital gains, um, I don't mind paying on capital gains, and that's just, in fact, I love to pay my taxes. I will do everything in my power to pay as little as possible, but I love the opportunity that this country affords you and I to invest, and so there will be some capital gains, and you know what? You just roll with it. If you want to avoid them, then you do 1031 exchanges, and 1031 exchange means that you are going to defer that tax and put it into the next property, and then defer that tax, and you can keep on rolling. And eventually, if you ever pull it out of that 1031 model, then you will have to pay capital gains, but those are actually avoidable. Refinancing is a non, uh, so in, at four or five years, you could hold the home, do a refinance. That's also a non-taxable event. So you, at some point when you're getting into two, three plus homes, you wanna have a really good CPA, you wanna have a good lawyer, and you wanna have those that understand really good aggressive tax strategies that are legal, above board, and correct. And find people with that experience they'll show you some of the other awesome tax loopholes because real estate is filled with them. Okay, David James, you got another question here. Also, are you buying homes that are near finished or do you have a crew that turns and burns them quickly and then rents them? Well, right there, I'll tell you that when I do my nationwide real estate, I do have multiple crews going at the same time because we're moving 30, 40, 50, 60 homes every single month. And um, that doesn't mean that we're getting into homes that are necessarily unfinished. It just means that we're getting them in top condition and top repair. That's a part of our strategy as we go in those hot markets. Where do you draw the line between time spent fixing up a foreclosure that's in terrible condition but will make more, mon more money than buying a home that is 75 to 100% ready with less money? This is a fantastic question. So in one of my va videos, we talk about our after repair value. And um, I generally like to stick with cosmetics. Cosmetics is generally carpet, paint, and a little bit of tweak in this or that. When you get into very serious rehab, you start opening up a can of worms, and I'll, I will get into serious rehab, but I expect a much higher margin of gain for the bigger project that has more work to put into it. Because those projects can take longer, you can open up cans of worms and problems or termites or discover all sorts of things and the bill can grow longer and longer or it just takes longer and longer. And For me, I'd rather find good margin on simple properties than good margin on difficult properties. That's my general rule of thumb, but you know, I'll go outside the box and do some of those things. I typically just, the more potential problems, the greater margin I need. And then it works fantastic. I bought a house that had kind of a, uh, it had a big crack in the basement and you know over maybe 50 feet there was like a three inch slouch and when I bought that house I ended up kind of leveling out the concrete and then placing the um, you know placing the carpet and then years later when I sold the house I disclosed the condition of it and one buyer got scared of it and backed out and another one you know bought it and I ended up making over a hundred and twenty thousand dollar gain on that house and so it had a problem, but I had talked to a structural engineer and I did my due diligence and I was ready for it because there was enough gain that made that house worthwhile. So 
If you're looking for bigger problems, make sure that you got bigger solutions in your profit margin. If not, don't tackle the big ones. Okay, last video for the day comes from Zachary Ferguson. All right, Zachary, what's your suggestion in getting with big time investors starting out? I'm honestly less interested in single family than I am in apartment complexes. I'm looking more for passive income and a good ROI for myself and the investors uh, where they can be more or less hands off. Zachary, this is a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. I think it's important to play to your strength. Um, because I've done thousands of single family homes, it's become an expertise. I really know that game inside and out. And the track record that I have now means that it's easy to make decisions and skip out on the obvious trial and error mistakes that you can do in real estate. When you jump into the big boy game with, uh, with apartment complexes, that's often putting all your eggs in a single basket where you might not have all the experience that you want. And that's okay to do as long as I would suggest having a mentor, someone with deep experience that can really take you by the hand and walk you through those bigger projects because bigger projects can mean bigger returns, but you know what it also can mean? A lot bigger risk. So just take the proper, the proper precautionary steps to make sure that you mitigate that risk as best as possible. You know I love it when you post questions in the comments below because we love producing these videos because knowledge is power and the more knowledge we can put in your hands, the more action you can take. And you know what? If all of us goes out there and successfully invests in real estate, your life elevates, you create solutions for homeowners and renters and people alike. And you know what? We are also collectively creating a more free great US of A. Why? Because we're building the economy. It doesn't happen by big government. It happens on the backs of people like you and I, small business business owners, real estate investors. So I want to thank you for doing your part. Don't forget to subscribe because you know what? We got more amazing real estate videos, training videos, and mindset videos coming your way.